Well, this webinar is packed with amazing information. Um, I keep seeing people join, so this is fantastic, but we will slowly get started here as I work our way through the intro before I pass it off to the amazing Alex, a strategist from our team. You are all joining us today for our Making Work From Home Work For You webinar. And what makes this webinar so exciting is that it's an incredible hybrid of obviously trend forward, innovative information, the latest and breaking, just like we obsess over and love to deliver here at EBCO, mixed with actual expertise that can benefit you at home right now in your current work situation, in your work setup at home. So I just love that double value that we have packed into this EBCO obsession webinar for you today. For those of you who are new, although I will say I see tons of our fan base here who are always showing up and supporting us. So thank you. But those of you who are new, who don't know us, we're Austin, Texas-based EBCO. We are a trend and innovation firm. We work with clients to look at the future of their industries. We can move to the next slide, if you don't mind. We are uh, here in Austin and actually our team is work from home. We are all over the place. We cover 15 states at the moment in our current growth. We're almost 20 people strong. For those of you who have been with us along our journey of webinars over the last few years, that is tremendous growth. So really excited to bring this to you today. We have so many clients that we work with. You can see an overview of them here. So we love dabbling in all of these industries. And it's just phenomenal to us that this topic of work from home is something that actually brings us all together. This unites us across industries. We are all experiencing this one way or another, and it actually has an impact on how we collaborate and how we innovate and just how the world has changed lately. So really excited to bring you this content today. I am gonna turn it over to Alex. You are going to be hearing from a star researcher on our team. And not only is she a trend expert, but she has a master's degree in ergonomics. So you are going to get a fun-filled webinar today packed with useful information. Alex, why don't you take it from here? All right, yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, so like Erin said, uh, I have a background in ergonomics and biomechanics, and I have my master's degree in that. Uh, my first job was at this really large commercial furniture retailer. Um, I worked in their product development lab, and we were uh, really building uh, office chairs that are comfortable and safe and supportive. Um, there's a lot of science that goes into them, and I was working in the lab doing that, um, working on all different sorts of office components, anything that you could find in an office, a table, a desk, a chair, a little storage component, everything has science and thought behind it. Um, and so that was really interesting and rewarding. I got my um, associate ergonomics professional certification there. Um, so I'm certified in this. I'm not just talking about it because I'm super, super interested in it, but I really have a background, uh, a scientific background in this. So I'm really excited to share it with everyone today. So today we're going to cover some trends in technology, this idea of the smartphone society, uh, some trends in human behavior and the culture of wellness that we see today, um, some trends in the home, how the home is changing, the expanding definition of what a home means. And then I'm gonna provide some ergonomic guidance and advice at the end, uh, some tips and tricks on how to make this all accessible, affordable. And then uh, we'll have some details at the end on how you can get in touch with me if you want to do like a one-on-one -on -one consultation, which I'm really excited about. So first, we're going to talk a bit about smartphone societies and the rise of mobile first behavior. So data shows that the interest in the term digital nomad has been steadily increasing since 2014. Um, so this here is a graph uh, from Google Trends showing the data for the search term uh, digital nomad. And we can see that there was like a little dip here when COVID initially hit and we were really shut down from travel, but it quickly bounced back and even exceeded previous levels. Um, so like how many of us on the call today are working on global teams? We have clients and colleagues distributed amongst different time zones. Um, here at EBCO, we are 18 people across 15 states. So a lot of cross time zone collaboration going on and we make it work and uh, it's such a great setup for us. Um, and there's really an increasing incidence of this becoming normal. Uh, so we'll dig into more of the reasons why and the trends that we're seeing in a little bit. 
Next, we'll explore this culture of wellness that we're living in today. So one of the first things that we really saw change about society when COVID hit was an increased focus on ourselves. So, you know, people were like securing toilet paper or taking care of their mental health. And there were free fitness classes popping up online, um, which was amazing. Like I was taking workout classes with my friends around the country from the comfort of my small apartment. And that was like something that had never really happened and been normal before. Um, and so now we have this hyper self-aware uh, self-care mindset, and we're seeing this in so many products that are offering functional benefits for the consumer. So we've already really seen this in the food and beverage space, um, but now we're beginning to see these claims show up more in other areas. Uh, we actually just finished this project for a large client in the home care and cleaning space. And one of the big trends that we, we saw there was that um, across a lot of their business units, there was like a functional fragrance component to a lot of products. Um, so like cleaning products and dish soaps that promise to relax you or energize you um, or, you know, clear the airways or something, but provide some sort of like functional benefit for you. So we're really seeing this culture of wellness pop up in like many, many categories. And we'll dig into that in a little bit. And then we are going to talk about the expanding definition of the home and the idea that we are not only spending more time in our homes, but that we are actually spending more on our homes, period. Um, our home is no longer just a place to sleep and like reheat leftovers, but it's a home office, it's a school, it's a restaurant, um, a personal gym, a sanctuary space, a retreat and more. And we're gonna explore some of the trends that we're seeing as the definition of the home expands and where we're really seeing the most growth and some of the cool innovations that are coming out of this space. And then of course, back to my bread and butter, we will tie this all back together and understand what the ergonomic implications are of us spending more time at home uh, with technology, focusing on wellness. I have a bunch of tips and hacks to share with everyone to show you how ergonomics can be affordable and accessible and it doesn't require like this huge investment in an expensive chair, even though I think it should, but it doesn't have to. Um, and I'll show you how you can really get the most out of what you already have. And it doesn't have to like be this big hassle. So before we like really dive in, I just want to lay the groundwork for what ergonomics is. So ergonomics is something that really gets thrown around as like a buzzword all the time. You see ergonomics on like everything and it, it, people who don't know what it means don't know how they're using it. And so it really means nothing in marketing. So I want to define it. Um, and what it actually means is the study of how equipment and furniture can be designed and arranged so that people can do work or other activities more efficiently and comfortably. Um, this is also known as human factors engineering. You might have seen it that way. And we usually notice um, ergonomics in a micro ergonomic perspective. So like a tool being advertised as ergonomic or, um, you know, a hairbrush or something like that, but something that's like tangible that we work with. Um, but ergonomics can also be um, experienced on a macro level, which accounts for factors like company culture, lighting, sound, um, things like that, like those big overarching factors. Um, and so before we continue, I would like it if everyone could drop in the chat box where they might have noticed ergonomics or experienced it in their day to day. So I have a couple of examples here. This is a curling iron with like a bent um, handle on it that just allows for more natural positioning. Um, this is a, <laughs> I think this is a garlic cutter, which I probably need because cutting garlic can be kind of difficult. And then uh, this is a shovel for the backyard. So I see office chair and mouse, kitchen veggies, chopper, standing desk, kitchen gadgets that are comfortable to use. Oh, the Dyson hair dryer is a great one, Kaylin. It makes like so much easier to get your hair done. Uh, and it really like eliminates that forcing your hand. Okay, these are awesome. Oh, Catherine lumbar pillow, that's a great one. All right, so starting off on our first chapter, we're gonna talk about technology and I just wanna orient how we're thinking. So I'm gonna open with this question, how is being more connected than ever impacting our bodies? So we hear this all the time that we're more connected than ever, but what does that mean and why is it happening? 33% um, of people claim that they are online almost constantly. Uh, after I read this, I 
did some self-reflection and I probably am one of those people. Uh, my new year's resolution was to have my screen time not be such like an absurd, shameful number and I'm still working on it, but it's hard to stay off devices when we are constantly surrounded by them. Um, I thought this stat was pretty shocking. Every minute, 127 new devices are connected to the internet. So I did the math there and that is 182,000 new devices a day. Um, compared to 2020, the number of phone owners has increased by 100 million worldwide, and that is expected only to rise. Um, global spending on 5G infrastructure is expected to reach 2.3 billion by 2030. So that is a lot, um, and those numbers are huge, but we just expect that this space will continue to grow and grow and grow. So I'd like to take a look at the technology of tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I mean, literally these things are here and they're coming and they're new every day, every week, every month. But this is like the now and what we are seeing now. Uh, tech Jury predicts that in just three years, the number of IoT devices will be three times that of the devices in 2019. And in 2030, the average consumer not like the ultra tech savvy, but just the average, will own 15 IoT connected devices. Um, so I don't know about you guys, I thought this was kind of crazy and I was reading it and I'm thinking like 15 IoT devices, but once you begin to understand like what these connected devices are, you'll realize you probably already have a lot of them um, or at least have heard of a lot of them. I will say that I am probably right on track to have 15 devices by 2030. Uh, and so a few places where we're seeing some of these more connected devices, especially in the home, are these smart home security systems. Um, so what is a little bit different about these is that, yeah, everyone has like a ring or a smart light system or something like that, but we're actually seeing some smart locks coming onto the market now. And these are locks that you can, uh, you know, turn on and off remotely from wherever you are, wherever you happen to be with your phone. Um, and so that's a pretty new innovation that's coming out of that space. Um, we're also seeing a lot of devices that enhance ambiance and enhance like your surroundings. So smart light bulbs, smart thermostats, smart outlets. But what's different about these is that these are not just being able to be controlled from your phone, but they are learning, they're like learning algorithms in them and they're understanding your behavior and proactively, you know, adjusting the thermostat or adjusting the light bulbs depending on your learned behavior. So that's a pretty interesting step that they're taking there. Um, we're seeing a lot in connected kitchens. So um, a lot of smart refrigerators, smart coffee makers. Um, I have a friend that works for Amazon and I remember years ago, she was telling us about this uh, Amazon smart microwave and we were like, what, why would you, what would that even be for? But now it's here and that's what we're using today. And um, so just to show you that like people are thinking about these things and they are constantly coming and they are a long way in the making. Um, and then finally, we have big tech backyards, and we're seeing a lot of movement around the idea of smart grilling, um, remote temperature monitoring, and making sure that like you have the ideal, there's no guesswork anymore. It's just the easiest grilling experience ever. And I know my fiance is super excited about it because he likes to burn meat all the time. Don't tell him I said that. Okay, so technology of the future. Um, the way that we connect, live, and work is transforming uh, thanks to increasing adoption of smartphones, cloud computing, um, the blockchain is now going mainstream, and then the metaverse, of course, I cannot not mention this. Um, it is just exploding, and I think this is like a really, really exciting area. Um, the future of work will foster this hybrid setup for many, leading with virtual workspaces that generate new forms of creativity, collaboration, and immersion. And we are already seeing this movement from companies like Microsoft. Um, they're developing this platform called Microsoft Mesh. Um, it's uh, allowing uh, mixed reality use for people. So you can attend a meeting as an avatar. Um, there will be like this immersive virtual office environment. So you'll be in the office, but you can be home. 
which I think is pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone happened to catch this article in Bloomberg like a week ago, but there's this new company called Portal. It's a startup and they're selling these booths and like tabletops that allow holograms to be present in the workplace. So you can be virtually present in a physical space. And I guess, depending on who you work with, that can be a really good or really bad thing. But it's just it's just really cool and really interesting that this is something that is coming very quickly and very soon. Um, and it's just really changing the way that we work. So what are the implications of increasing our tech and phone usage? Um, smartphone users spend an average of two to four hours a day hunched over reading emails, sending texts, checking social media sites, um, and again, I did the math on this one, so you don't have to. That's 700 to 1,400 hours per year. And then when you think about that in terms of months, that is one to two months that people are putting stress on their spine. So imagine one to two months of putting that much pressure and and on your spine. Um, there have been studies done to determine how neck flexion, so like craning your neck to look down at your phone, um, changes the amount of weight and strain on your neck. So upright, uh, just in a normal position, we are putting about 12 pounds of weight on our neck, which is totally normal. Um, we are built to sustain that load, uh, but fully flexed over, that can be up to 60 pounds, which for me was hard to conceptualize. So I found out that that was the equivalent of carrying around an eight-year-old on your neck for several hours per day, which I don't know about any of you, but that does not sound fun for me. Uh, and so it's, important to just keep that in mind and remember that while you're on your phone because it's hard to get off your phone but if you can at least adjust your posture to put you in a better position that'll be good um, doctors are seeing an increase in headaches neck spasms jaw discomfort shoulder pain wrist and elbow pain uh, numbness and weakness in arms you name it there is a problem related to technology around it. So we're seeing some innovation around these problems. You might not have realized uh, that these innovations were even addressing these problems, but a lot of like pop sockets or any phone cases that uh, take the load off of your hand and decrease the force that you have to like really hold the hand, the phone with, um, are actually addressing this ergonomic problem. It's making the phone a lot easier to hold and there's no strain on your body when you're doing it. Um, so that's a really interesting uh, pop socket is a force of good. I love mine. It really is. This is like, I was skeptical about it at first uh, before I actually learned about ergonomics, but it's really great. Um, these, I think everyone should really have a pop socket. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen this anti-gravity case that went TikTok uh, viral, but it's this like hand-free phone case that allows you to put the case, um, like you can attach it to a wall, a mirror, whatever you want. So it's at the optimal position for your head. It's at the optimal position for your hands. Um, and it's, it's literally hands-free anti-gravity phone case. It's really interesting. So that's some of the interesting movement that we're seeing in technology. And so moving on into our next chapter about the culture of wellness, um, I wanna just orient our thinking by starting off with this question. How is the definition of wellness expanding and what are the implications of this shift? So wellness is really this like ever evolving term. Uh, many years ago, it was like this little vibrating platforms that like shook off weight or that crazy like wine diet that like went goes viral every couple of years, um, perms and leg warmers. And today it's like much more holistic and it's focused on full body wellness from the inside out. Um, it's so pervasive that McKinsey has identified these six dimensions across, across which uh, wellness is perceived to span. So that's better health, fitness, nutrition, appearance, and mindfulness. So before we continue, I would love if everyone can put into the chat, which of the six they're most excited about and why. Amazing when something cool like a pop socket takes off as cool, but helps so much. Totally, I mean, I agree. Yeah, better health, better sleep, mindfulness, better appearance, better fitness. Yeah, it's cool to see so much enthusiasm around all of these. I, it's, it really is cool. I really think there's so much cool movement coming in these spaces. Better sleep helps with everything. Totally agree, Irene. Awesome. Cool. So 
So data shows that consumers are planning to increase spending in specific categories like uh, memory and brain enhancers, beauty supplements, nutrition, and mindfulness, but really anything that will help to enhance and increase overall personal wellness is going to do well here. So we're even seeing companies that started off in like the wellness supplement space, taking that into new formats and new avenues. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the new co and UE. Um, they're like a supplement company, but now they have this perfume that has, um, it's called forest lungs or something like that. And there's this specific ingredient in it that is supposed to help open up your lungs as if you were like out in nature, breathing in like the fresh air. Um, and their whole theory is that wellness can take on different formats that we're not used to. So a supplement doesn't have to be a pill. A supplement can be a perfume. It can be a candle. Um, it can be anything. So it's kind of interesting to see where that exploration is going. Um, so here I've highlighted a few products that are addressing this desire for more overall wellness. Um, these aren't just fitness trackers. They track sleep and mood. Um, this Amazon halo band, I don't know if anyone has one or has tried to look into one, but it's pretty interesting. It tracks your tone of voice and analyzes it in tandem with your heart rate and other body signals. And so it can understand your mood. Uh, I don't know if that's like too big brother for everyone, but I think that's pretty interesting and pretty cool. Um, these Amazfit power buds can be used to monitor your posture in addition to just being regular earbuds. Um, they're they can sense a change in your head movement that's associated with slouching posture. And so it can alert you to when your posture needs to be readjusted. Um, so these are going further than just counting calories burned and steps taken. And if you notice, none of these actually have screens. So in an effort to curb information overload and exhaustion, these basically just track you and kind of alert you when things are out of homeostasis and when you need to sort of like readjust or pay attention to something. But other than that, they're really just like monitoring in the background and not looking to add to your daily information intake. So I thought that was pretty interesting because in today's day and age, it's like information overload all the time. And it's really easy to get caught, caught up with like constant notifications and push texts and all that stuff. So these are pretty interesting because it's really trying to add to that wellness idea and concept, but not give you more to like take in every day. So within this space specifically, we're seeing a huge increased interest in fitness since now you can really do it uh, from anywhere at any time. So we're really seeing the rise of the fitfluencer who a lot of these people are coming out with um, at home friendly workout programs that you can purchase directly from them on Instagram or whatever medium. Uh, and there's usually some sort of community component to these like a Facebook group or an accountability aspect like a live Zoom call or something to simulate the idea of a group fitness class that we all enjoyed pre-pandemic. Um, there are also a number of companies that are developing these sleek looking, like all in one sort of machines that ideally blend in with your surroundings of your home, and they tend not to take up too much space. Uh, they're enabled with smart technology to enhance your workouts. And I thought these are cool because at my last job, like the big, big buzzword was always resumercial, which is the combination of residential and commercial. And it was the idea that people don't want... Um, like office looking furniture in their homes, but they want the benefits of that furniture in their homes. And so these sort of take those same design principles and that's sort of the same approach here that it's a more aesthetically pleasing product, but it serves like a real benefit to you besides just being like a piece of furniture. And so that's really exciting. And then there's this new idea of fitness travel, which is the idea that you can be taking a class at anywhere at any time, regardless of the location. So uh, I know personally, I'm really obsessed with these workout classes called housework. It's offered by this instructor based out of Miami. Um, and so for those of you who didn't catch it at the beginning, I, uh, I live in Michigan. I don't live in Miami. I wish I did. Um, but it's cool that I'm able to wake up every day in Grand Rapids and log on and take a class out of Miami like that was never really done before. And then lastly, we have movement in the metaverse, which I'm super excited about. And I think there's so much opportunity here. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies, specifically boxing companies right now, 
uh, move into the metaverse fitness industry. They've partnered with Oculus to provide this like enhanced heightened sensorial experience in a fitness class. Um, I'm really excited for whenever we get to biking and I can actually experience being outside for a bike ride in like San Francisco or wherever I choose to ride instead of just watching a screen with like no feedback. Um, so if anyone out there is working on that, sign me up for testing, I will clear my schedule. And so of course, increasing our movement is not new. Um, but we are seeing a lot of trends um, resulting from this increased movement, notably that more people are getting joint replacements at younger ages. Um, so this was something that was like, this was like the first thing they said to us when I started my master's program. Uh, and it didn't really mean anything to me because I didn't really know anything about it yet. Um, but it's this idea that basically there are rising rates of obesity in the, U in the U.S. specifically. So U.S. data for the past decade indicates that 54% of patients undergoing total hip replacements and 79% of patients undergoing total knee replacements are either obese or morbidly obese. Um, we also have technology that has advanced so that joint replacements are typically now an outpatient procedure. Um, people can receive their new joint and go home in the same day. Um, and there's also like a huge change in expectation as to what the level of physical activity is possible as we enter like our 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, there's a shift from being told that 50 is too young for a joint replacement to understanding that if we wait for a joint replacement, it can impair our mobility and increase likelihood of heart disease. So um, I think this is pretty interesting because obviously like we're putting wear and tear on our bodies as we're increasing our movement, but um, it's just showing us that there are solutions for this. Like, I don't want the takeaway here to be that movement is bad because that is not at all what I mean. I encourage you to move and, and continue to move, but um, just to understand that like it will put a load on your body, but that it's okay and that there are solutions for it. And that um, this is something that we should be planning around and you know innovating around and preparing for. All right, and then for our third chapter, we're going to discuss the home. And to get you thinking here, I'll open with the question, how are we thinking about the home differently and what new functions is it serving us? So homes used to be more similar, in my opinion, to like hotels. Um, it was really just a place to store your belongings, a place to sleep at night. Uh, it was just like a roof over your head. And now I think that the home is evolving to mean a lot more to people. Um, it's a place to rest and recharge. It's an office, it's a home gym, it's a restaurant, it's a school. Um, it's serving so many different functions and it's a hub, it's a haven. And I think this is really being reflected in the design of the home. People are becoming much more intentional with, with how they use the space. Um, what they bring into their home space. There's a lot of uh, specific designated areas. Um, and I think it's really interesting just the innovation that we're seeing coming out of this. So one particular area that we're seeing a ton of innovation is the kitchen. And data shows that consumers are increasingly purchasing quote unquote fun appliances. So they define this as like immersion blenders, juicers, slow cookers, ice cream makers, but more than just like the average pot and pan. Um, people are continuing to spend more time in and using their kitchens for experimenting, learning, developing skills, elevating their home cooked meals. Um, one pretty cool example of this is this kitchen hub from GE. Uh, it centralizes the whole kitchen experience and it connects all of those devices onto one platform. So it's just one example of a lot of really cool digital innovation in that space. Um, and then, of course, there are a number of solutions that you can bring into the kitchen to make it an overall more comfortable space to be and to reduce potential industry injury. So the two that I've picked are ambient lighting and anti-fatigue mats. So ambient lighting is awesome for helping to reduce eye strain, um, especially like underneath cabinets or like in areas where it's kind of hard to see. Uh, believe it or not, eye strain is part of ergonomics. And so it's important to have solutions to kind of alleviate that. 
And then anti-fatigue mats, of course, are working to reduce the force being pushed back up to your legs after standing for long periods of time. So if you know that you're going to be in the kitchen preparing like a meal that's going to take hours on end, which I do that. So no, no judgment if you do that as well. Uh, it could be a really good idea to get an anti-fatigue mat and it'll just make that experience better for you. You won't have like those achy joints or achy legs or anything like that after standing for long periods of time. But it's really important to have some sort of solution to like nourish yourself while you're engaging in that sort of activity. And then the second space where we're seeing a ton of movement is the home office. So as I mentioned in earlier slides, uh, remote and hybrid work is really here to stay. Um, there is a really big increased interest in spending in cultivating a space that is more permanent and works to facilitate working at home. Uh, data scientists estimate that one in every four jobs will be remote by the end of this year. Um, so this space is really something worth paying attention to. Um, with working at home comes different aches and pains. So a number of at-home solutions have been developed like sit-to-stand desks, ergonomic keyboards, ergonomic chairs, and footrests. And what I like about these is that they're always evolving and changing. Um, so when I worked at my last job, we were designing office furniture for whatever the latest set of data about bodies showed. So the CDC actually releases like a set of data. It's called NHANES, N-H-A-N-E-S, uh, every year or so. Um, and it is it is civilian data and it has all of these different like anthropometric data, like the circumference of your head, like the width of your hips, like, like every body measurement that you can imagine, it has that data. And it's like tens of thousands of people in this data set. And basically what we would do every year is like go through, understand how like the key parameters were changing and then understand how we needed to shift the design of whatever chair to fit like the average person and what the adjustments were that we needed to fit like both extreme ends of that spectrum. So um, I think this is really interesting because these things are always changing. Like, yes, standing desks and keyboards and chairs have been around for a very long time, but we're continuing to innovate and improve them based on how people's bodies continue to change. So um, I don't want this to seem like it's just like a space that's been around forever and there's nothing going on, but there's like actually a ton of movement in science and innovation that's going on there. And there was a lot of really cool work that we were doing at my last job. So before I continue, I would like to ask everyone, uh, where else are you seeing the home evolve and how? Oh, definitely the garage, that's a good one. Outdoor spaces, yes, so much, so much going on in outdoor spaces. That's one of the areas that people are spending the most in, but for the purposes of this, not so much ergonomic movement, so I didn't include it, but that's a, that's just a huge one. Garage and bedroom, yep storage, high-end host hotel aesthetic. Yeah, for sure, Melissa. Yes, a ton of that. A lot of like just cultivating that like retreat mentality in the home is like such a huge space right now. Considering function in all spaces, Jackie, that's a great one. A lot more, just like I said, being like intentional about how you use your space and what sort of things like you're bringing into the space. Oh, Diana, I will get to that in just a minute. Best office chairs for a small bodied woman. I will get to that. Don't you worry. All right. So the big picture, right? We have this uh, wellness conscious consumer spending more time at home with more technological capabilities. Um, how can we address the needs of this growing population and how do we ensure safety and comfort while doing so? All right, so here is the unfortunate trend alert. People are staying home and working from a space that is not optimized for them. And the next wave of workers' comps claims are work from home injuries like low back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome, repetitive strain injuries, neck pain, tendonitis, bursitis. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call has some sort of work from home ailment or injury or something, or they can relate to what's on the screen here. 
Um, injuries cost time, they cost money, both for the employee and the employer. And it's really in everyone's best interest to make sure that you are as insulated as possible from these types of risks. All right, so if I want you to take anything from this ergonomic portion of the webinar, it is that a neutral spine is a happy spine. And by that, I mean that I really want the pelvis to be in a neutral position when you're sitting. So uh, you might wonder what a neutral pelvis means, and I didn't know what it meant before I went to school either. Um, if you stand up right now, like if you literally stood up out of your chair, uh, that would be your spine and pelvis in a neutral and ideal optimal position. And so now if you try and sit back down without moving your upper body, so making sure that like your head, neck, and your chest stay upright, that's going to be a pretty optimal posture for you without hunching or overarching your back. Um, that should be the ideal that you strive for when we work from home and we're sitting at a kitchen table, a bed, a couch, wherever we might find ourselves, where we're really compromising the position of our spine and straying from that ideal position and what it really is. Um, a lot of people ask me about like the straps that you can wear that sort of pull you back and everything, um, those like posture correcting vests or whatever. And those are fine, but I tend not to really recommend them because you're not actually working to improve your posture. Something is just holding you back. Um, but really the key to maintaining like a good posture while you're sitting and not having to think about it is just working on the muscles that are in your back. Essentially when you work, uh, when you work out, your muscles get tighter. So if you work out your back muscles, they're going to get tighter and they're going to pull you back. So they're going to pull your, oh, your shoulders back. They're going to push your chest forward. Um, and that's really how you can ensure that you are actively keeping yourself up in a posture. Otherwise, once you take that little uh, posture correcting vest off, you're just going to revert back to that little like hunched position and you really didn't achieve anything. Uh, you didn't really alter your posture. Um, so that's just something to consider while you're reading over this information. So what is the optimal way to sit at a desk? Um, ideally, this is your optimal position. So you can see here, you want the monitor, like the top line of text to be right in the middle of your field of view. So if you're looking straight ahead, head up and chest is up and everything, you're looking straight ahead. You want that top line of type to be right in the middle of that field of vision. Um, your arms should be relaxed. Your elbows should be at or about 90 degrees and your forearms should be about parallel to the ground. Um, your chair should ideally have a backrest and armrest to um, you know, support you and your movement. Your thighs should be about parallel with uh, the ground and your knees should be at or about 90 degrees. And then your feet should be on a flat surface. So I'm hesitant to say that your feet should be flat on the ground, but because you can have a foot rest if you need to, which is totally fine. I have a foot rest. Um, I actually think that it is a child's uh, potty training stool, but it's the perfect height for me. And I found it on Amazon and it works perfectly for my space. And I, it keeps my feet flat on the ground. So as long as your feet are flat and in contact fully with a surface, that is what counts there. Um, and so taking these basics into account, it's important to understand that in order to achieve this, um, using a laptop and only a laptop to do work will inherently put us in a bad position, right? So if you think about it on the laptop, the screen and the keyboard are connected. So in order to have the keyboard in the correct space for your arms, it can never be at the correct space for your eyes. In order to have it at the correct space for your eyes, it will never be at the correct spot for your hands. So um, it's really important to consider having like an external keyboard or an external monitor or something there. And then what I also want to point out here is that uh, movement is important. Movement is key. Um, I'm sure that everyone has heard that sitting is the new smoking uh, and it's being regarded as like this terrible thing for your health. But I'm here to tell you that the truth is that's just being static for long periods of time is actually what it's harmful. So if you stand for eight hours a day, 
you are no better than someone who is sitting for eight hours a day. But the point is that you want to continue moving and have regular cadence uh, of movement throughout the day. All right, and so here are two different models of movement that have been uh, studied pretty extensively. So here we have the 28-2 model, and then over here we have the 30-20-10 model, which uh, both provide different uh, intervals of sitting, standing, and moving throughout the day. Um, and then when I say movement, I'm not talking about like doing burpees or squats or anything intense. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that if you want, but uh, just going into the kitchen to get a glass of water or taking your dog for a walk around the block or something of that nature um, is just fine. So just an activity that really gets you moving and helps to keep your joints um, lubricated and happy and healthy is more than enough. Um, I'm not expecting that like you burn 300 calories in 10 minutes of movement every hour. It doesn't have to be intense. It just has to be purely movement. All right, so I wanna highlight here um, a couple of things that I've seen in stores or online that are kind of taking advantage of the buzz wordiness of the word ergonomics and making claims that just aren't really true. Um, the first is this like cute pink fuzzy Amazon chair that I'm sure like everyone has seen or has considered something like that before. It's a chair that looks nice. Um, it really offers no benefits because there are no adjustments on it. Um, it's likely made with really low quality materials that are not going to last long and are certainly not going to support your body the way it should be supported. Um, like I said, at my previous job, we literally were like designing and building office chairs. Um, and there's so much time and effort and data and science that goes into these. Um, and that's why they cost more than $100 on Amazon. <laughs> like it really is worth it. I thought this tweet was kind of funny and gets to my point. Um, it says, do you guys think it's worth it to buy an office chair? I would sit in it for 10 hours a day for the rest of my life, but I'm not sure. For context, I have spent $17 million this month on oat bars that don't taste good. Um, and I know it's like, kind of an exaggeration, but if you think about it, like we're sitting in our chair for eight hours a day. And how long do you spend sleeping in your bed? Probably about the same amount of time. Um, and there's really no hesitation to spend on like a good mattress for a comfortable night's sleep. But there seems to be this hesitation around getting like a truly good um, and supportive office chair when you really are spending the same amount of time in it. Um, and it's just something to consider. I mean, these Amazon chairs are, yes, they're very cute. I totally apologize, Melissa, they're super cute. Um, but it's really not made with like super high quality materials. And like I said, the only adjustment on it is this height adjustment. Um, and to Diana's point about what are the best office chairs for a small bodied woman, um, just a hot tip for all the women here, uh, office chairs are built for large men. So obviously you can't put a chair on the market that is built for a small woman because it will only fit that size person. But if you build an office chair for a large man, so many more people can fit into it. So um, office chairs that have adjustments like arm adjustments, um, seat depth adjustments, that's like the big one for women because we have shorter legs. Um, any type of adjustment, like the more adjustments, the better. So I know they're super ugly. They look like little machines and everything, but it really is for your benefit, um, especially if you are not like the 95th percentile male, which I would guess most people are not, um, but you really want your chair to fit you. And these, these chairs really just don't do much more than look nice in the space. Um, second, I want to talk about um, this like desk uh, bicycle chair. Um, it's a great idea because you are moving throughout the day and I totally appreciate that. Um, it keeps your arms in the right position. You can see that his arms are like parallel to the surface. Um, however, there's not enough space to use like the external monitor or the external keyboard or anything like that. Um, and so obviously his hands are in the right space, but his head is now looking down and craning his neck down. So this guy is spending who knows eight hours a day biking away with the weight of an eight pound child on his neck. 
because he insists on having this little bicycle desk. So um, it looks great. It's great in theory, but it really just is not doing you uh, any justice. Um, and then lastly, I feel like everyone in the world has seen these uh, ball chairs. Um, there's so many of them on the market. I could not recommend these less. Um, they give you a ton of spinal compression. There is no back support. Um, most importantly, it is like really the exact opposite position of how your pelvis should be in a chair. So in any like good office chair, um, it's like a con, uh, it's a concave, uh, you know, contour in the seat. So um, that's like the plane that your body should be moving in. And this one is convex. It's literally exactly opposite. And you are not meant to be moving in this sort of plane of movement. Like your pelvis just isn't built for that. Um, so unless you literally are like a pregnant woman just bouncing along, I really do not recommend these at all for any like long-term um, sitting at all. Um, and then, like I said, your best bet here is going to be buying a used or a slightly used um, commercial office furniture chair from like Facebook Marketplace or something. They're super expensive um, if you buy them new, but people put them on Facebook Marketplace and they really like don't understand the value of what they have. And they're like steals. Um, like it's like robbery, what you can get away with. So anything from like Steelcase, Herman Miller, Knoll, Hayworth, um, anything like that, it's gonna like really, really serve you well. Um, Jesse, I am happy to discuss that if you want to get on a call. I don't know anything specific about it, but I would totally look into it and we can schedule a call and I can totally talk about it with you. That would be awesome. And so I wanted to just show you guys a couple of at-home hacks that I have for ways that you can make this um, more affordable and just use things that you have in your house. It doesn't have to be anything special or fancy. So um, if you're sitting at a desk and your chair is too short for your desk, so you could see like my elbows here are not parallel to the surface or to the floor or anything, um, then you can try putting a cushion on your chair to raise your height up and then putting a box under your feet so your legs aren't dangling. So here I put this cushion up here and you can see that my arms are a little bit more parallel to the surface here. And so you don't have to use a pillow or a cushion in your house if you wanna go out and buy something. This gel memory cushion is an excellent uh, base of support and it will serve as a great ad for height and comfort. Um, and you can see that this contour here is mimicking the contour of your lower body. Um, and that's really going to put you in the optimal position. And so let's say you're sitting, you're raised up, but now your back is hunched over when you're using your laptop, because you can clearly see that it's not the right position for my eyes. Um, then you should try putting your laptop on a riser. It doesn't have to be fancy. I have this like little acrylic riser from Amazon, but you can also do books. You can do boxes. I mean, it does not have to be like a high value production at all. Um, laptop risers are a great tool to help lift up your screen so that it's at the right height for your eyes. Um, and you ideally want something, I made this mistake when I bought this acrylic one, but if you can get something that is adjustable so that you can raise it up or down and really get it to be the right position for you, that's always gonna be better. All right, so say you've done all of that and now your wrists are hurting from resting on a hard surface then you can try putting a cushion or a towel underneath your wrist. Um, this literally is just a towel that I rolled up from my bathroom upstairs. This is not fancy. I did not spend any money on it other than I did just to buy the towel. Um, and it, it does not have to be bulky. Um, it does not have to be tall. Uh, the edges are tapered now that we're seeing a lot of that in the space. So it allows for more like natural resting position of the wrist while typing instead of um, where as they used to kind of actually be harmful, but now they're much better. This I love. So this, if your seat is too long for you, there's no room between your calf and the back of your seat. You ideally should have like two fingers width of space between the back of your calf and your seat because otherwise it can cut off your circulation. It can give you spider veins, which I know terrified me, um, but it really is just not good for your overall circulation. Then you can try getting a lumbar support behind your back. 
Um, I just put a basic pillow behind my back and that was enough to sort of keep me up and upright. But if you want something like a little bit more substantial, I really, really like these um, mesh back supports. Um, I tend to like mesh more than memory foam or gel because memory foam just sort of molds to your back because it's memory foam. Um, mesh is like weaved in a way that it is taught in specific zones and areas that it will provide like targeted support to your lumbar spine, to your cervical spine and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit more specific. And I find that it doesn't really conform to your back that it actually does its job. All right. And then we have, um, if you are in pain because your knees or hip flexors hurt from sitting for long periods of time, then you can try standing and working, of course, with modifications. So you can see here, I just had my laptop on my kitchen counter and I was bent over trying to like adjust it. Um, here, you can see that I'm standing up. I have my laptop riser and then I put them, I put some additional books underneath my laptop here. I put my keyboard on some books and now I'm standing up straight. I'm not bent over, I'm standing up straight. Um, but if this is all too much, if this is too much of a production for you, Amazon and a ton of other retailers offer these really cool desk risers um, that are being built with a lot of adjustability. And you can literally keep your whole office set up on your desk and then pick it up, move it to a different space and then raise it all the way up. So it really is much less of um, a production than moving like the books, the riser, et cetera, et cetera. And so what is the future of ergonomics? There are new ergonomic innovations being made every day because of course th people want things made easier and safer for them. So here are a couple of cool examples that I found. This is um, a belt that a new parent can wear and it will help make uh, holding a baby a lot easier. There's like a little support for the baby so you don't have to um, reach over and crane your back to kind of support them there. Um, this is a pretty cool example of this new desk called Echo. Um, and these desks actually move. They are sit to stand desks, so you can raise them up and down. And then they also move to foster um, collaboration. So you can be working with a couple of people in like your pod. And if you wanna work by yourself, you can move it back into a more um, solitary space. If you wanna work with people, you can move it towards them, but it just makes the whole idea of, um, working and keeping your space optimal and ideal a lot easier. And then there's a lot going on, a lot going on in like this, the um, bed and sleep space. Um, there's a lot of these like intelligent beds and intelligent pillows and stuff that will really conform to your body and keep you in that optimal position. And um, my mom has a bed like this and it is my favorite thing about going home. Um, and it is just amazing. It's so comfortable and I never wake up sore. Um, and it's just like, these are like very cool ergonomic inventions that are continually being put out. Um, and yeah, so I hope, um, everyone enjoyed that. I know Erin has a little something to say here. Yes, Alex, thank you. That was so fantastic. I hope everyone was inspired as our team was when Alex delivered all this information. You can tell the depth of her knowledge is just extensive and happy to say that Alex pumps this level of research and in depth into every program she works on. If anyone on the call has any initiatives to discuss, you know who to reach out to myself or Kaylin or Andrew at the EBCO and super exciting for today. Alex did this for our whole team. Email alex at theebco.com if you want to get on FaceTime or get on Zoom and have her look at your space. She did this for us. She told us what was great or not so great about our chairs, how our laptops were set up, our double screens. We all have footrests now. So a lot of things going on in the workspace. And she offered to do this for anyone on the call. So seriously, take her up for it. The call is quick and informative and smart and just a great way to connect with Alex, who is a total expert, as you can tell from this. And we're going to send out this deck so that you can peruse it on your own time or possibly share it with someone else you think could find value in it. Thank you all for being so engaged today. We love having you on our webinars. And Alex, I will say that future of ergonomics slide that you just presented was a bit inspiring. So maybe there'll be a 2.0 to this 
to this webinar in the future. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I love leaving inspired and that was definitely inspiring. So that was awesome. Anyway, of course, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. And Alex, thank you for all of that knowledge and for sharing your expertise with us today. And we will see you on future webinars. Thank you.